Good evening and welcome to Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort, a local Champaign-Urbana peace group. I'm Carl Esterbrook. My guest is our favorite Republican, Ed Mandel. We're recording this at noon on Tuesday, August 21st, in the studios of Urbana Public Television. Our subject is the wars the U.S. government is waging around the world and the racism we display to those we're killing in accord with the Latin proverb proprium humane ingeni est odesi cum laseris. It's human nature to hate those you have injured. While President Trump is talking peace to the leaders of Russia, North Korea, and even Iran, the U.S. is making war in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, principally to control the flow of oil out of the Mideast and North Africa, which the U.S. uses as a weapon and it's against its economic rivals from Germany to China. Thousands of U.S. troops are killing people in these countries, although most Americans are barely aware of it. More than a quarter of a million U.S. troops are stationed in a thousand U.S. military bases on foreign soil, most of them ringing Russia and China. The 70,000 members of the U.S. Special Operations Command are active in three quarters of the countries of the world. Their activities include kidnapping, we call it rendition, torture, and murder. As the rest of the world recognizes, but Americans don't, they're nothing less than American death squads. The rest of the world recognizes that the U.S. today is what Martin Luther King called it long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, an international criminal surpassing all others. But most Americans don't know that, protected as they are by government and media propaganda. What we do here at Aware on the Air is talk about the unmentionable, the U.S. government killing around the world, and encourage our fellow citizens to oppose it. Few Americans know, for example, that the U.S. drone warfare in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia has killed more than 1,500 civilians and comprises almost 5,000 strikes. Keep in mind that that war is still a secret. The U.S. doesn't keep records of whom they kill, and the U.S. has no real idea who they're killing, whether targets or passersby. Each missile creates so much damage and vaporizes so many people, we just don't know the truth about the scope of assa the assassinations the U.S. is responsible for in the Rhone War. But we do know that this continues escalating across U.S. administrations, and the victims include Americans and children. All are killed extrajudicially. No charges, no evidence, no trial, and no chance for defense or rebuttal. Meanwhile, the war in Afghanistan is not getting better, it's getting worse, says the seventh U.S. commander uh, in Afghanistan in recent years, and uh, the capital, Kabul, was rocketed yesterday uh, in this war that the U.S. has been conducting for 17 years. I want to talk tonight about uh, a number of points. Uh, the, uh, that bear on the U.S. economic war against the integration of Eurasia. Eurasia inter uh, Eurasian integration, the economic development and uh, interconnection of Europe and Asia, uh, Eastern Europe and Asia, has been an object of American concern since the 19th century. We'll read about the open door policy at the end of the 19th century. What the U.S. is afraid of is that a, any power, Eastern or Western, in control of Eurasia will exclude the U.S. from exploiting that region. And this, as I say, is a worry from the 19th century that ranges through the 20th to the present day and animates American policy around the world today. We had an example of that yesterday. Washington froze Russian assets in the U.S. worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, there have been other freezes and other sanctions that do the same. But the U.S. does this one on the grounds that Russia is responsible for the attack on the Skripal family in Salisbury, England. You have to read this stuff to believe it. 
Russian-owned assets in the United States worth hundreds of millions of dollars have been frozen as part of the Washington, of Washington's sanctions against Moscow, the U.S. Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Siegel Mandelker, Mandelker said on Tuesday. Quote, the actions of the U.S. Treasury have significant consequences for the financial interests of individuals and businesses that were affected, including the blocking of hundreds of millions of dollars of Russian assets in the United States. Foreign direct investment into Russia has fallen 5% since 2013, with direct investment from the U.S. falling 80%, uh, according to that statement. The uh, uh, Defending American Security from Kremlin, Kremlin Aggression Act, close quote, was passed in the U.S. Senate uh, last week. The act uh, makes it harder for the U.S. to pull out of NATO. This is a direction this, of, of the uh, American political establishment, which has always opposed Donald Trump, not for his uh, uh, personal style, but for the fact that he threatened the ongoing war policy of the United States. That war policy includes explicit wars in eight countries around the world uh, and uh, pr war provocations primarily against Eurasia, against Russia and China. Uh, the great fear among the American political establishment was that Donald Trump meant some of these things, he said, about ending these wars. And they've worked vigorously since he came into office to be sure that the belligerent policy of the Obama administration, the only American administration to be at war throughout two presidential terms, uh, that that continues and that uh, Trump does not ameliorate in any. That's the background of the entire Russiagate nonsense. Um, the uh, concern for NATO uh, is also is involved not just with Europe, but with the fact that it's NATO troops that the U.S. is using as uh, mercenaries, essentially, in the Middle East, notably in Afghanistan. Uh, the overall foreign policy of the United States dictates uh, the uh, involvement with NATO, and Trump's casual comments about leaving NATO uh, in the uh, campaign scared the political establishment to death. Uh, the new act in this, uh, passed by the Senate this week sets a two-thirds requirement for a potential U.S. withdrawal from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. In other words, if Trump tries to change the relationship with NATO, he needs a two-thirds majority in Congress to do it. This is outrageous and nonsense, uh, but it's clear what the political directions are. The political establishment wants its war footing. It's the war party, which is made up not just of the Democrats, but a good number of Republicans as well, to say nothing of the, quote, intelligence community. The war party wants its war footing against Eurasia, and Trump threatens it. You're watching Aware on the Air. We have a good bit of business on the agenda today, and I am going to uh, move from a worldwide crisis to a personal crisis. Oh. Uh, a personal crisis that happened some years ago. I'm talking about my midlife crisis. Uh, <laughs> My midlife crisis uh, occurred before most of you listening were born. So, oh, wow. I, I'm talking about I'm talking about history here. Are you expecting to live to 100? <laughs> <laughs> My midlife crisis occurred at age 40, when I was uh, teaching at a university in Massachusetts and uh, bemoaning the uh, stale, flat, and profitless uh, activities that I was carrying on during the day. And I was uh, mentioning this to a playwright friend of mine who said, oh, I should call a friend of hers who was putting up a uh, play across town in Boston, in a section of Boston called Charlestown, uh, and uh, perhaps they'd be interested in my participating. I said, I'd love to. I've always been interested in the theater. I've never acted, and I don't know anything about it. I can't do it. Uh, she says, oh, give them a try. They may use you. Uh, well, in fact, they did use me uh, because, as usual in provincial theater, uh, there's a shortage of males of a certain age. Men over 25 are rare in uh, provincial theater, 
Um, and I was cast, uh, untutored as I was, uh, in a wonderful production of uh, Friedrich Dürrenmatt's The Visit. Uh, and I'll uh, look it up if you're interested or if you get a chance to see it. Uh, good and important play from the 20th century. Uh, out of that, I developed an interest in theater. For one reason, directors kept calling me because I was a male over 25 who might appear in their plays. Uh, and I got to do some wonderful things. Uh, I wasn't wonderful, the plays were wonderful. Uh, <laughs> and I learned a great deal, uh, in part by not being wonderful, uh, uh, learned what I should do in the theater. And it combined with an interest I had always had uh, related to my academic work in Shakespeare. I was not a Shakespeare scholar, but I was interested enough in the events of his time, uh, Shakespeare's time, that uh, I found no uh, difficulty in getting interested in Shakespeare and theater, a logical conjunction, uh, and carrying that into over to other historical questions. Um, to end this part of the story, uh, I became an Oxfordian, as it's called in the business, uh, that, saw the, that refers to scholars who believe that the author of the Shakespeare poems and plays was not in fact the man from Stratford, William Shakespeare, but uh, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, and that Oxford uh, was the, uh, uh, the background, in other words, of the, of, of the author of those plays was um, uh, quite different from what we've learnt uh, about the background of William Shakespeare of Stratford. That's important because it ranges into, er ranges into areas of politics and religion that are very much involved in the play. Uh, people often are, admire, admire uh, the extent to which the author of the plays is familiar with the politics and the theology uh, of his day. How could a man educated in a grammar school in Stratford ever come to understand that? Well, uh, it's an interesting question, a sidelight to what we're talking about today, because I want to mention a, uh, a peculiar new book by one of the leading Shakespeare scholars in the country, not in fact an Oxfordian, uh, that is, he believes that William Shakespeare, uh, closest to his real name, of Stratford was the author of the poems and plays. Uh, how, you cry, does this have anything to do with the things this program usually considers? I'll tell you. <laughs> the hypocrisy and racism of American elites seems to have a depthless quality to it. The vast conjuries of hysterical elitists hyperventilating over the phantom collusions of Donald Trump can now add a Shakespearean scholar to their sordid ranks. Trent Trump has lately been limbed and slimed in a book by Stephen Greenblatt, eminent scholar of the Bard, Kogan University Professor of the Humanities at Harvard University, general editor of the Norton Anthology of English Literature, and the Norton Shakespeare. The Harvard luminary uncloaks his bourgeois liberalism in a freshly minted historical analysis, a book called Tyrant a sterling meditation on, you guessed it, tyrants in Shakespeare, of which there is no shortage. You think of Richard III, think of uh, the questions of Coriolanus, uh, the uh, history plays in general uh, often deal with questions of tyranny. Uh, a, par a parenthesis here, uh, Edward de Vere, who as I say probably wrote these things, was close to the throne, indeed had a claim on the English throne in the 16th century. Uh, but he was certainly bound up with those who uh, reigned uh, in Europe, notably Elizabeth I. Uh, the questions of tyranny uh, were very important indeed uh, in Shakespeare's time uh, as contemporary political problems. What um, this uh, wretched Harvard scholar Stephen Greenblatt has done is taken those concerns with tyrants of the 16th century and applied them to a new use. What mars the narrative in Greenblatt's tireless need to parallel the Bard's historically ravenous seekers of power with the Pagliacci figure of Donald Trump, uh, the, the, the clownish figure of Donald Trump. 
rather than focus, this is, this is the Shakespeare scholar writing about the 16th century, but what he's, writing, what he's actually writing about is Donald Trump. Rather than focus on comparing Trump to, say, Sir John Falstaff, Shakespeare's memorable fool from Henry IV, if you've never seen a production of Henry IV or seen Falstaff, Falstaff portrayed on stage, why, uh, wait until I do it. Uh, Greenblatt gets serious. He leaves no page unturned in his overweening campaign to recast President Trump as a figure of terrible ambition rather than as a court jester and royal liniments. Greenblatt's a smart man, but this is a book that sacrifices Shakespeare and the nuanced personal and political insights of his work to the pursuit of Trump. So the latest episode in Russiagate is a purblind uh, Shakespearean scholar uh, attack on uh, Trump uh, and the promotion of Russiagate using the 16th century poet uh, who wrote the Shakespeare plays as his basis. Greenblatt certainly had no intention of using the book to impugn his own fellowship of noble elites, uh, Harvard professors and others that he belongs to, but by summoning the comparison between the president and the Shakespearean past, he leaves the door ajar for reinterpretations of his premise. While Trump may share the same kind of narcissistic malevolence of Bolingbroke and Suffolk, two of Shakespeare's villains, and the state-wrecking policy of Macbeth, Macbeth is generally known. He is in a general, in a certain sense, like the Duke of Gloucester, Humphrey of Lancaster, from the play Henry VI, Part Two. Not at all in terms of Gloucester's unyielding rectitude, for Gloucester's an honest man, but rather in his role as a sacrificial lamb in the contrivances of his elite rivals. A man that finds himself in the path of a powerful clan of intelligence agencies that are among the most vigorous and authoritarian pillars of the American ruling class. Inept in leadership, inexpert in policy, Trump is merely an obstacle to the perpetuation of the capitalist imperialism of the neoliberal model so expertly guided by Barack Obama. That's what the fight in Washington is about. Ranged against Gloucester in the play are, as Greenblatt points out, Suffolk, Beaufort, York, and King Henry's conniving and collaborating French Queen, Margaret, who suggests French interference in English affairs. Here's a representative passage when the avaricious faction hurled baseless accusations at Gloucester, at Gloucester compare Trump. Uh, the point is, the, the point that's being made here is that uh, our uh, Shakespearean scholar uh, who thinks that he has found in the depiction of tyranny in uh, Shakespeare a picture of Donald Trump may be right, but he has it upside down. In the play in Henry VI, uh, the Gloucester is Lord Protector uh, of, the, of the realm and is charged with crimes. Uh, we might see Gloucester as a parallel to Trump and uh, the king uh, being, in fact, uh, standing in for the American people here. York, uh, uh, a noble, says, "'Tis thought, speaking to Gloucester, "'tis thought, my lord, that you took bribes of France, "'and being protector, stayed the soldier's pay, "'by means whereof his highness hath lost France." That's the Russiagate charge, in other words, that uh, Trump was in the pay of Vladimir Putin. Gloucester, the Trump figure, says, Is it but thought so? What are they that think it? I never robbed the soldiers of their pay, nor ever had one penny bribe from France. No, many a pound of my own proper store, because I would not tax the needy commons, have I dispersed to the garrisons and never asked for restitution. The cardinal, number one of the nobles, says, It serves you well, my lord, to say so much. Gloucester says, I say no more than true, so help me God. York, in your protectorship you did devise strange tortures for offenders, never heard of, that England was defamed by tyranny. Gloucester, why, tis well known that whilst I was protector, pity was all the fault that was in me, for I should melt at an offender's tears, and lowly words were ransom for their fault. 
unless it were a bloody murderer or a foul felonious thief that fleeced per passenger, poor passengers, passengers in 16th century English means travelers, I never gave them condign punishment. I never gave them what they deserved. Murder indeed, that bloody sin I tortured above the felon, or what trespass else? Suffolk, my lord, these faults are easy, quickly answered, but mightier crimes are laid unto your charge, where you cannot easily purge yourself. I do arrest you in his highness' name, in the name of the king, in the name of the people, and here commit you to my lord cardinal, keep until your further time of trial. King Henry, my lord of Gloucester, tis my special hope that you will clear yourself from all suspense. My conscience tells me you are innocent. As I say, to keep the parallel going, that limps some, you have to see the king there as speaking for the American people. Here is a predatory clutch in the scene we've just heard. A predatory clutch of power seekers attacking an unpopular Lord Protector with uncorroborated accusations. They are under a spell of confirmation bias whenever he attempts to argue his innocence. They attribute every assertion of blamelessness to his evil cunning. They leverage baseless innuendo to make charges of tyranny. They use their manufactured indictments to handcuff his power, literally. Greenblatt, the scholar who writes this book, also notes the reason why the little power-mad self-righteous clique choose murder over a proper trial for treason. Quote, they know, uh, they know the charges they have brought against him are false, and since they fear that the king's ardent support will make it difficult to engineer a conviction in the absence of real evidence, Greenland also points out that they profess to be concerned for the good of the state. Note that while they embrace noble intent for themselves, they deny Gloucester's attempt to claim the same. Could this be any more reflective of today's Russiagate hysteria? Not capable of bringing real proof in an American court of law, corrupt as it is, Robert Mueller's special counsel cleverly, or perhaps transparently, cho choose to indict Russians who will never see the inside of a North American courtroom, as well as a, as well as a handful of Trumpian associates who is, a, who is able to convict for crimes uncovered in his borderless troll through Trump's nefarious real estate backrooms but which have nothing to do with the so-called collusion suspicion for which Mueller has been engaged. Mueller has already proven his fealty to the deep state with his pathetic lies about Iraqi we weapons of mass destruction. Few people forget Mueller's background and how he ended up in the position that he's in. Uh, he promoted the uh, uh, great crime, the greatest crime so far of the century, uh, the American invasion of Iraq. Add to this his lantern-jawed image of probity and gravitas, and he fits the role. Shakespeare could have wielded him well in a production of Henry VI. Not only this, but like the anti-Gloucester posse, the Democrats make a great theater out of exhibiting their all-consuming desire to, quote, protect our democracy, close quote, a phrase that economically conveys two falsehoods in three words protect our democracy, the two falsehoods being A, that's a democracy, and B, that they're protecting it. It deserves a prime time place in any definition of two-faced in Webster's or the enumerated faults of neoliberal Democrats. Likewise, the Harvard scholar again notes an actual plot against Queen Elizabeth's favorite, Sir Walter Raleigh, and possibly the Queen herself, organized by the Earl of Essex. This is in the 1590s. Essex plot partners actually commissioned a performance of Richard II, the Shakespeare play, about a king overthrown just prior to the launch of their own conspiracy, which failed miserably. But what were the conspirators doing? Seeding an idea in the mind of the London public, a historical form of Christopher Nolan's inception, you may have seen Nolan's movie from almost 10 years ago, I think, about putting ideas in people's minds, uh, uh, in people's subconscious, when high-tech perception management was used to guide action. Uh, it's a little far-fetched, but the notion is that using the popular stage, which was popular in Shakespeare's time, to uh, promote uh, uh, political ideas uh, doesn't wait on the high-tech notions available in the movie Inception. 
The play happily conjures the idea of a salutary coup d'etat, a restorative tonic for the state. The play presents how important it is occasionally to overthrow the government and add, add a, uh, uh, a, a moral government, exactly what the Russiagate people say they're doing. You have to at least admire the gall of Essex co-conspirators in the 16th century to stage a play that so obviously prefigures their treason. Yet today, what have the Democrats and the intelligence agencies and their slavish media newsrooms and op-ed departments been doing unceasingly since even before the election? Casting the sexist and racist character of the president in the starkest relief possible, then adding in the poison of treason to a cocktail of contempt, a trifecta of indictments that they believe will surely produce the constitutional coup they hope for. Why? Not because they give a damn about democracy, since we don't live in one and have long since abandoned the practice if, practice, if not the pretense of democracy, for plutocracy. No, the Democrats want Trump out because still smiting from the embarrassment of their world historical loss to the buffoon they handpicked for an opponent, they're desperate to regain power. The effort is led by members of Congress Nancy Pelosi, Adam Schiff, Dianne Feinstein, Elijah Cummings, Gerald Nadler, and others. They've cleverly aligned themselves outright with the intelligence and military community because they know the latter is likewise desperate to maintain the trajectory of American hegemony that's been in place since the end of World War II. The intelligence front is led by former CIA lead head and godfather of Russiagate, John Brennan, who spied on Congress, and also former National Intelligence Director James Clapper, who purposely lied to Congress about surveillance. Special Counsel Robert Mueller and his ravenous gang of le legal muckrakers lead the formal attempt to legitimate the fatuities of Russiagate. Add to these an ocean of mainstream media zealots, like the Times' Charles Blow, and MSNBC's Rachel Maddow, and CNN's Wolf Blitzer. This loose confederacy of dunces have perfected the art of maintaining permanent crisis mode. This is precisely the same kind of vigilance with which the neoconservatives and its supplicant press corps maintained a perpetual state of alarm before George Bush doubled Bill Clinton's record for the slaughter of Iraqis. Uh, Bush probably only, uh, Bush killed more than a million Iraqis, uh, Bill Clinton probably only about uh, 500,000. Nobody seems to remember or know about the church committee from the 1970s. Ed remembers uh, yeah, when yeah. I used to do a program on uh, uh, left ra do a, a program on left radio, my then colleague Paul Muth uh, frequently invoked the Church Commission, which he thought had been forgotten, indeed it had been forgotten, uh, after the remarkable uh, uh, revelations that had come forth from it from the 1970s. Uh, he pointed out that it was hard even to get a copy of what the Church Committee had found and what the Church Committee testimony was from what the American 1970s. American Activities Committee. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, that committee uncovered the rank treachery of the CIA and its peer institutions. Nor do people recall how pliant and tractable some of their ranks were in the run-up to the worst war of the century, that is Iraq. Nor do they seem to recall the history of our foreign policy community and its biblical devotion to global domination by any means necessary. They're no less zealous than the Zionists, a compliment to the highest or of the highest order, for the true devotees of settler colonialism and imperial expansionism. You can follow the line of imperial thought from the buttoned-up imperialist realist George Kennan and Dean Acheson in the years after the Second World War, and John Foster Dulles in the Eisenhower years, to the smug savagery of Henry Kissinger, then to the fell designs of McKinder acolyte Z Zbigniew of Brzezinski. Uh, that's a reference we've mentioned here before, but uh, don't have time to her today. And all the way, I, I meant McKinder, and all the way through to the Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl Project for a New American Century, 
then on to the empowered manias of Dick Cheney and R Donald Rumsfeld, and straight through to the slightly more muted personas of Richard Gates and Ashton Carter, and finally on to the unhinged ravings of John Bolton. The Democrats now lionize these two people, most of them Republicans. Uh, that's, that's the real division in American foreign policy. The neoconservative trend, which goes back, in fact, to the Second World War, uh, and uh, its critics few and far between. Shakespeare at least understood the vile character of politicians well and unflinchingly demonstrated it in his work. From King Lear, Lear says to his uh, compatriot uh, who's been blinded by the opposition, get thee glass eyes and like a scurvy politician seem to see the things thou dost not. And it's seeing thing, things that they do not see that characterize, certainly, the Russiagate affair. This is, yet this is precisely where so many liberals, of the kind who worshipped Barack Obama, like some once worshipped Elvis, slip into a facile naivete. They continue to overtly trust discredited institutions that need shuttering far more than any Republican charlatan in the White House needs impeachment. Democrats trust the intelligence agencies they've conspired with to regain power and work to hinder any efforts at peace the president makes in the meantime. This from a community that railed at Republican obstructionism and professes a commitment to peace and foreign policy. That is the historic democratic position. Perhaps only three decent, perhaps the only three decent decisions of Donald Trump since November 2016 have been one, meeting King Kim Jong-un, a step dutifully ignored by all other administrations since the Korean War wended, ended, and calling off the threatening and chest-thumping military drills that have helped reinforce a paranoid government in Pyongyang. In an emblematic instance of mainstream media coverage, the Washington Post, with its laughable mast headline, Democracy Dies in Darkness, breathlessly reported on stunned U.S. officials who fretted like brittle octogenarian grandmothers about meeting with such a duplicitous, duplicitous rogue nation. Naturally, quote, U.S. officials caution that we ought not to trust the DPRK after their littered past of broken promises. Of course, the Washington Post forgets to note Washington's own record of shifty deceits and dissembling guile. Much like the New York Times did this week, when it professed feigned concern over slaughter, slaughtered children in Yemen, without once mentioning the U.S. Role, role in facilitating that war. Two, efforts to warm relations with Moscow after the Obama administration rebooted the Cold War when the security state realized that fear-mongering about Islamic terrorism was wearing thin on Western publics. The subsequent reorientation of American power against established powers, rather than terrorist cliques, flies in the face of Trump's attempts to form positive alliances with Vladimir Putin over Syria, to bring Russia back into the G7, and to end the theatrics over alleged Russian government efforts to subvert the fake democratic process in the U.S. His sideline meetings with Putin in Vietnam, behaving like a young teen trying to escape his parents' watchful eye for 60 seconds, the parents being the intelligence community and, what, and the press, and their summit in Helsinki, perhaps the need for a formal summit was triggered by the intense efforts to keep these two leaders apart, efforts by the American political establishment. Three, Trump's decision to quit funding terrorists in Syria, as the Obama administration did surreptitiously by diverting weapons deliveries through allies and by rebanding jihadists as moderate rebels. The Obama administration supported the vicious war in Syria throughout with terrorists, jihadists, from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, the threat to end this shameful war by Trump outrages the American political establishment uh, and leads to the intense pressure on the Trump administration to consider, continue the warlike actions of the Obama administration. 
democratic obstructionism in the form of Russiagate has foiled attempts to move forward on all three fronts, belying their professed distaste for both war-making and partisanship. It's been said that crowds of 90,000 only show up when an event is tribal, a thing sufficient to require witness. The nature of this witness, witness is steeped in violence. The collective wish is to witness violence and to become by osmosis a part of the instrument of, the, over, a part of, the instrument of violence. This is what we're witnessing. Tribal warfare inside the ruling class, happily joined by the wage serfs of each tribe. We Westerners affect a cosmopolitan liberalism that claims to have evolved beyond tribalism and sectarianism. We reserve, we reserve such descriptions for Arabs and Persians and Africans. We have happily matured into partisanship and obstructionism and narrow-mindedness but never, never anything akin to the barbarism of tribalism. We left all that behind after we escaped the dark ages into our sunny enlightenment from whose born no lucky traveler returns. Yes, the scientific breakthroughs of the age were an unrivaled boon, as were the reason-based rebellion against divine right. But plenty of our pre-enlightenment past remains. But really, our politics are just a variation on the theme of tribalism our version dressed up in the liniments of decorum and altruism. Like everybody else, and unlike tribal conflicts, our tribal battles are over a necessary slaughter that has been happily offshored to the happy relief of sightless Americans. It's pointless to join the tribe you're dominantly associated with between the Democrats and Republicans. The largest voting tribe in the country is actually independence, a more loosely bound amalgam of the mob, as Greenblatt, the Shakespearean scholar, puts it. That's the real problem, the worry that the mob will get the wrong idea. It is better by half to stand aside of the titanic power struggles at the top of the social hierarchy than to lend one's sniveling shout the tsunami of self-righteousness already crashing down on us. Stand aside rather than sit astride. <laughs> the professional classes have claimed that spot in any case. Far better to look at the history of American capitalism and its highest stage imperialism, assess its motives, and call the present defense of democracy campaign for what it truly is, a slow motion constitutional coup and a rapid fire perception management masterclass. Our own founding father and slave owner, the author of American, Thomas Jefferson, the author of America, Thomas Jefferson, wrote this, quote, The most effectual engines for pacifying a nation are the public papers. A despotic government always keeps a kind of standing army of newswriters who, without any regard to truth or to what should be like truth, invent and put into the papers whatever might serve the ministers. This suffices, uh, the ministers of government, this suffices with the mass of the people who have no means of distinguishing the false from the true paragraphs of that newspaper, close quote. It was Thomas Jefferson who said that. Was he wrong? Greenplatt, the Shakespearean scholar, would have us believe the champions of justice and decency are making a heroic effort to defang a coming tyrant before he brings us to certain ruin. Please. Even Falstaff knew better than that. This is a, a piece uh, uh, on an unlikely way hung on the uh, uh, wretched Shakespearean scholar uh, Greenblatt uh, by Jason Herthler, uh, and appeared in the uh, uh, on the blog Counterpunch. I recommend it, and I'll put a, place a li link to it on the Facebook page for Aware on the Air. You've been watching Aware on the Air, and we'll turn to our... <laughs> I thought we'd have to get a playbill for that. <laughs> well, that's true. We should have that. <laughs> playbill for your Shakespeare. We'll turn to Ed Mandel. Yeah, I also don't want to have to hack into your computer. <laughs> yes. it's like, it's like, oh, yeah, so I, I was going to... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I mean the abrupt uh, <laughs> charging in here. Um, yeah, I was just going to mention uh, that I noticed that uh, in different uh, places on on your Counterpunch uh, web, on this Counterpunch website, they mentioned uh -huh. they compared Trump supporters with cultists. I, I think I think it's the other. I think I'm serious. There's there's one that one that mentions. But yeah, the, where was that line from? Uh, I don't, I don't, I, I, no, I, I do. I remember it. Uh, it's a, 
Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry which one it was here. Uh, um, but they, they are comparing uh, the, the Trump supporters with cultists. Awesome. And uh, another thing, another another point I mentioned, I, I saw sort of recently, is that someone um, thought that two years of accusations by the media of of, of, of Russian collusion is evidence of the collusion yeah. itself. <laughs> that, that's a lovely point. I, I, I remember, yeah. I remember, I remember yeah, reading uh, that. It's like, what the heck is that all about? We, we, so, can't, we can't have been talking about nothing all this time, right? Right, right. No, no, without any evidence, of any supporting evidence at all. It must be true. Yeah. We've been talking about it. <laughs> very, very strange. <laughs> it really is. Uh, the cultist thing is an interesting notion here. I mean, I, I, th I think the cultists are on the, on the Democrat side who believe in this, and this two years of, of accusations is, well, is actually evidence. I think it actually testifies yeah. to another problem that the um, political establishment has, uh, and that is that they can't recognize, and by the political establishment here, I, I mean the leadership of both political parties, uh, uh, the uh, intelligence community, which is so important in this mess, uh, the Pentagon and others. I mean, this is the, uh, th what has sometimes been called the permanent government of the United States, yep. regardless of presidents and whoever come and go. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, uh, political establishment of the United States has a serious problem in that it can't admit why Trump was elected. Uh, the reason Trump was elected uh, has less to do with his sterling personal qualities okay. uh, and a great deal more to do about what's happened to the American public after 40 years of neoliberalism. What has happened in America over the last generation and more is a remarkable um, concentration of wealth, a vast increase in inequality, and an indeed an accelerating increase in, in inequality. People who went to the polls in 2016 uh -huh. know that their life chances have been confiscated by these changes in American society uh, over the last several presidential administrations. Uh, they know that the neoliberal programs and the neoconservative programs, more war and more inequality, that the pre previous uh, administrations had followed were not doing them any good. And they voted for Trump because Trump attacked those policies, well, however erratically and however strangely. Well, uh, and see, that was the, the reason for Trump's victory. Well, uh, and the uh, uh, inability of the, of the political establishment to admit that leads that establishment to say, well, people voted that way because they're deplorables. They voted that way because they're racist. They voted that way because uh, they hate America and so forth. Um, they, you, they, they, they lifted up a certain identity. Oh, well, oh, sorry, not America. They hate women. Yeah. Uh, it was in yeah, that was the, uh, uh, this the is refrain, a, uh, yeah. uh, this was, this is the line the political establishment in America has taken to explain Trump's election because it can't admit the real reason for Trump's election, well, which doesn't involve praise of Trump, but it does involve an account of what's happened in America uh, over the last generation. Well, Carl, I, again, I voted back in 1992, I voted for another crow, crazy uh, businessman, Ross Perot. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was a short leap to go from Ross Perot to another crazy businessman named Donald Trump. <laughs> uh -huh. And for me, there was no problem doing that. And I had already rejected the Clintons back in 92. So for the, for, so the thing <laughs> that it was- earlier. Do early non-adapter, uh, non-adopter. Huh? Right, no, no, I, I, I saw through them almost immediately when they when they appeared on the stage. Uh -huh. It's like, okay, well, and that's the reason why I voted for Ross Perot, and I, I wasn't ready to vote for Bush, you know, I, at that time I was Bush senior. And so I voted for Ross Perot, and so and, and, and so when, when, when I hear all the, the, um, the analysis of, of the election, of the 2016 election, I don't understand because I mean, it's almost as if I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton because she's a woman. It had right. nothing to do with that. Well, it had that's nothing. That, I, I have no yeah. problems with women. I, I have the thing a lot of Republicans would have, would have been around the pocket if they, if they had seen someone like, like Margaret Thatcher. I don't know. I know obviously. I mean, if Margaret, if some version of Margaret Thatcher had, had run for for president, they would have no problems with that. Obviously, you have probably you have issues with her, I'm sure. But I, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just offering out a, an example of someone that that Republicans would have would have supported without knowing that problem, that problem. But I'm, I'm saying, yeah, 
um, as far as the election is concerned. Yeah, I, I, my voting for Donald Trump, um, he, he, from my perspective, it wasn't as much he was rich, because anybody who was going to run for president had to be rich in order, in order, to, in order to afford the campaign. But I, I, as far as a rich person, he is actually an outsider within, the, within that community. Um, I, I believe uh, he is actually. Um, I, I believe. Um, I'm not believe. I, 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 I think I've read, I've read articles where he, that, that suggest that he's an outsider within that it, it, that that community of uh, I mean, of, of, of wealthy people, whatever, if, if you will. Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think some so, of it, yeah. the, 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 it's a, a less important reason yeah. for yeah. Uh, Trump's ostracism by the political establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, the important reason, I think, is the one I suggested a moment ago. Yeah. But the uh, less important reason is the fact that, uh, and the one that the uh, political establishment fixes upon in a way, mm -hmm. in order not to admit the real reason, is that Trump isn't PLU. He's not people like us. He doesn't come from that uh, Set. It's a, diff a little difficult to talk about this in both class and status terms, but the fact of the matter is that uh, whereas Barack Obama spent his life becoming PLU, people like us, not just by going to Harvard Law School and uh, uh, the following the path of uh, uh, a quote liberal, close quote, uh, political figure in Chicago, uh, it was a matter of uh, sort of, sort of style and finally political agreement that led Obama to become uh, uh, acceptable to the political establishment, what I mean by PLU. Trump, for various reasons, including uh, his crassness uh, and his inability to uh, ingratiate himself, uh, as Obama did, uh, is not. I, I actually I believe he did connect with his audience. I mean through the, through the, that, that, that well, TV show The Apprentice, if you will, which 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 made them they made the media perceive him as a, as a clown. I mean, or yeah, as, yeah, a, yeah, as, yeah. as a carnival barker, if you will. But I, I think he did connect with, with with his audience, if you will. And I mean through through things through media like well, that. Be careful here. I'm talking about two different audiences. But that I'm I, talking I, I, about audience. the political establishment oh, yeah, on the right. one hand and the majority on the other hand. You're right. I'm sorry. Uh, a distinction that comes to be called popular in these days, right. but exact, I think that the point, I think you're precisely right, that what Trump did is make himself acceptable, indeed uh, uh, appreciated, by the populace, by yeah. the majority, yeah. by that group. Whereas well, the... Through, uh, through Nielsen ratings, if you will. <laughs> what, has, what has been called for a century the political class, yeah. sort of about 20% of the population who's been to a good, been to a good college, right. uh, that, that group Obama ingratiated himself, ingratiated himself with easily, Absolutely. and Trump never could. Right, I agree. Yeah. What else is on your list? Well, I was going to mention that we were coming on an anniversary of the 2000 and the 9/11, uh, 2001 uh, uh, fiasco back in, <laughs> if you will. I mean, I consider it a fiasco more than a or a, 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 an insurance scam. <laughs> this is this is what happened on the 9, 9, September 11, 2001. I guess the I guess I guess it's an insurance scam with by uh, was the well to call it an insurance scam. Uh, you you're saying 2001 was uh, a, a uh, Set up job? Uh, yes, it was an inside job, yeah. and uh, but also was the insurance scam by uh, I forget the fellow's name who owned the buildings. Yeah, I he, know. He, bought, he bought the buildings uh, a couple of, a couple of months before the uh, the event, and then he immediately bought insurance, and then immediately they were destroyed exactly a, a, as he wanted. Yeah. He made it, he made it an enormous profit, and and because apparently they were apparently the twin towers were a liability and uh, asbestos wise, and apparently they I guess I they, don't uh, think this is true. I mean, I don't I'm think sorry, that disagree, but, was but, but there is at least a germ of truth in it, yeah. in that the collapse of the Twin Towers is based on the fact they had been built where they were precisely to escape regulations that would have precluded their collapse. Yeah, well. uh, that they were, in, as you say, to some sense, an insurance scam, or yeah. if not an insurance scam, at least a business scam, an attempt to try to make money on this part of, of, uh, of um, uh, Manhattan by, uh, by breaking the rules on the sort of safety the building should have. Now, that doesn't, I think, uh, preclude the attack uh, yeah. organized uh, by a, 
apparently, it was only, uh, yeah. terrorist groups on, yeah. on it. I don't think it was a put-up job, there was no but, th cer but yeah. it's certainly possible. The fact of the matter yeah. is that the uh, thing to realize about it, I think, for contemporary politics is less the uh, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, crimes of businessmen, yeah. but to realize that the attack assuming it was indeed carried out by foreigners, mostly from no. Saudi Arabia, no. uh, was a response to what the U.S. had done in the region. 9-11 was a counterattack, yeah. uh, a great crime, a horrible attack, uh, a terrible thing, but understandable in terms of the context uh, of the motivations of the people who carried it out. Now, that assumes that you're wrong, yeah. and that it wasn't a put-up job. I, I believe it was Operation Northwood's uh, an effort. They're not part of that part of their uh, part of the pre pre previous uh, operation, and it was it was created to uh, to uh, justify a, a war on terrorism, a eventual war on terrorism, which was a, a great boon for the uh, military-industrial complex. You know, but yeah, no. It, it, so Larry, Larry Silverstein, the owner of the building, he got of the buildings, he got paid off, and uh, the where the war, the, the with the Department of Defense, they got paid off, and uh, and um, all the other, and then there you go. So, so it was, uh, very, it was a very profitable situation. Uh, as I say, uh, the, the discussions like this yield evidence. Uh, yep. The truth of the matter uh, is uh, uh, not uh, uh, pellucid, although, as I say, I think it's uh, not the case that uh, uh, it was that sort of set-up job. What the uh, we can remember, it, I mean, it, it, you know, the argument that this was the new Pearl Harbor and so forth designed no. to, uh, designed to uh, encourage Americans to carry on a foreign war. Uh, remember the war on Iraq, uh, which killed a million people oh, yeah. in, in, in Iraq, was not predicated on 9-11, yeah. although the Bush administration tried to say that Saddam Hussein was involved with 9-11. It was fudged, yeah. It was not true. Yeah. I mean, the the government of Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11 under either of our descriptions. Right. Oh, yeah, they didn't right. have anything to do with it under your description, right, right. and they didn't have anything to do under the description that seems to me more reasonable. It was I recommend fudged, yeah. for anybody who's interested in the, the, the question, uh, they might look at the best-selling book about 9-11 in the years immediately following it, and that was written by, of all people, Noam Chomsky. Okay. Uh, Noam Chomsky's little book, 9-11, uh, puts it in, in some context. But my point here is that the warfare economy that you quite rightly uh, excoriate uh, in the U.S. Uh, did not depend on 9-11. It depended on uh, the war in Iraq, which was promoted on completely different matters, including the lies of Robert Mueller involving weapons of mass destruction <laughs> in Iraq. So uh, what goes around comes around or something yeah. like that? I suppose another thing we could discuss also, I don't mean to change the subject swiftly here, is we could also <laughs> Maybe discuss... Maybe a good idea. Yeah, also we discuss uh, Julian Assange. And, oh, uh, yes. But if we're talking about news and real, real news and fake news, and, <laughs> and that, exactly. which apparently is a, a, has dominated the, uh, the, the discussion. It's, it's, almost as if, it's almost as if fake news was created by Donald Trump, which is not true. I mean, fake news has been around forever. <laughs> Yeah. And it, it, it's been around for a long, long time. It, it's been, it's been, it's, it's a, so that when you have someone like Julian Assange who, who prints things with evidence and and with supporting evidence to right. prove for for, and suddenly he's excoriated as as a as some sort of a, uh, a treasonous uh, person who needs to be brought to trial. It's like wow. Uh, it's a very good point. It, it's no accident the same people, American liberals, uh, notably including our own senior senator. Um, who uh, call for the uh, uh, prosecution of uh, Julian Assange are also uh, great Russiagate fans. <laughs> I mean, this is it's 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 part and parcel of the same situation, and uh, points out that there really is no opposition to the uh, wretched uh, political activities of the American establishment with the possible exception of the uh, chief executive. That's yeah. really quite remarkable. That's yeah. a situation I think has not existed in American history, at least I can't think of any other obvious examples of that uh, in quite so 
stark terms. I will note that there are, are some people on the left who have who have seen the, the quality of, of a Julian Assange, but they are, they are, very, they are very rare. Uh, someone like uh, for Jimmy Dore, there's some YouTube very videos. There's a number of YouTube videos where he is, him, him uh, he and is also some of his, um, his uh, cohorts, with you know, the co cohorts. Mm -hmm. I mean, but what the system, and they, they, they are, they do expose the Democratic Party, you know, and, and the entire, and the entire discussion. And, 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 that's, and, that's a very of, good uh, point. Uh, this all this that, that's dominated the media for the last two years, which has made just it's just extraordinary. I, 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 <laughs> here they accuse they they accuse of Donald Trump of fake news of bringing up the issue, uh, and and then they 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 actually created a whole um, reason for the for the, that, that fake news. It's, it's almost as if they they um they accuse other people of the of the crime that they they themselves committing. That's what psychologists call projection. You know, they are they are seem to be projecting all the time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if you wanted to discuss. Last, got a minute left. I don't know if you wanted to discuss uh, in, in one minute the uh, the Vatican, the, the, the pedophile. Ah. <laughs> I don't know if that would take one minute. I don't know. Uh, this is a. But, but apparently, some of the pedophiles only took one minute. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's an interesting situation. I mean, it's yeah. really quite horrifying. Yes, and, it is. Uh, yeah. The uh, situation is one that probably we can't cover in a minute. But at least they're at least they're, at least they're apparently they're going to try to deal with it. And I guess yeah. they're deal with the problem, which has been dealt for for decades. You've been watching Aware on the Air for Tuesday, August 21st, in the anniversary month of two of the greatest crimes of the 20th century, the atomic bombings of the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the United States on August 6th and 9th, 1945. Only the German death camps for Jews, gypsies, and other presumed enemies of Germany are in any way comparable to the mass murder of presumed enemies of the U.S., Japanese civilians. Seventy-three years later, the U.S. government remains what Martin Luther King called it long ago, by far the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. We must stop it. Our thanks to Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson, for research. This is Carl Osterbrook, former members and friends of AWARE, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, reminding you in the words of Edward Devere and The Tempest, what's past is prologue, what to come in yours and my discharge. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies, and a good night to you.